So you saw me on Monday as well. I'm still Chris, uh, still one of owner students. Um, I'll be giving the second lecture on interconnection networks. Um, so this is just a continuation of what we talked about on Monday. We'll go a little more in depth on sort of the basics of how interconnect works. Uh, and then at the second half of this talk, I'll give you um, a few more sort of recent works. So some of owner's work and some of uh, my work actually, and then some of um, uh, Kevin Cheng's work and other of uh, owner students will talk as well. Um, about some of our actual research results on interconnects. So just to remind you, um, these are the readings. This is the same slide that I showed you on Monday. Um, so we have a lot of papers. Uh, there are some of the basics that explain sort of how the virtual channel routers work that I explained on, uh, on Monday. So the Dali paper, the Mullins paper, um, sort of this uh, overview of the tile, tile processor, which is one of the real uh, processors that uses a mesh knock. Um, that's once laugh. Uh, some of the more recent stuff um, Patel was one of the first papers he described, um, one of the indirect switching networks um, between processors and memories, and then um, a few more, so a survey and then the BLESS paper there. Um, anyway, so I, I think one of those, so I think BLESS is one of your required readings you had to submit a uh, review for, but in any case, um, if you're interested in interconnects, and even if you're not, uh, these are all good papers to read. So, but of course you're all interested in interconnects. So. Goes without saying. Uh, okay, so interconnect. So I talked about um, uh, uh, sort of an introduction, over an you know, overview of uh, different terminology and interconnects and how they work at a high level. Um, last time, I also talked about different topologies. So remember, we talked about meshes, rings, uh, hypercubes, um, various other topologies, and I talked a little bit about how buffering and flow control work. So I'll just sort of give a very high level um, overview, reminder of what we talked about. Um, and then today we'll dive into uh, a little bit more detail. So we'll talk about uh, specifically how routing works, so a few different routing functions. I remember routing is the problem of if I have two nodes in a network, A and B, and I have some number of paths and links between them, routing is uh, which links do I take in order to get from A to B. Um, so that can be an interesting problem if you have a network with a lot of different links, for example, a hypercube. Um, I'll talk a little bit in more detail about uh, router design and how you know, routers actually work internally. We touched a little bit on that with a virtual channel router, um, but I'll say more here. Um, and then I'll give a few brief uh, just notes or high level um, information on network performance metrics and some differences between on-chip interconnect, which is the more recent uh, sort of NOx that we've been talking about, and off-chip, which is the more traditional you know, processor memory switch interconnect uh, sort of thing. Um, so after that uh, sort of front matter, that's about the first half of the lecture. Um, I'll try and give uh, as much detail as I can on three recent bufferless deflection routing designs. Well, actually, bufferless and then minimally buffered is MinBD. Um, so these are uh, so the first one is owner's work, and the second two are um, some of my papers with my co-authors. Um, and then I'll turn it over to Kevin for about the last half an hour um, for uh, very recent work, HAT heterogeneous adaptive throttling, which is a sort of a way to get more performance out of an interconnect. So just to give a brief review, um, remember we talked about topologies. So I'm showing three different examples of topologies here. Um, the first one is a mesh, right? So I'm sorry, not a mesh, a crossbar, um, right? So we have, uh, in this example, just four nodes. Uh, and I'm showing the sort of outputs of the nodes on the left and the inputs of the nodes on the bottom. And so remember, a crossbar gives every possible connection. So if any of these nodes wants to uh, send traffic, send a flit or send a packet, to another node, uh, there's a, a, a crossing point or a, a switch element between any node. So if node two wants to send a packet to node one, then this switch will be turned on after some arbitration, uh, and the packet will just naturally flow from two to one. Um, so remember we, uh, okay, so, so we talked about that. Um, the next uh, sort of class of networks that we talked about, and there are different ways to build these, are multi-stage logarithmic depth networks. Right, so there are different uh, ways to build this. For example, um, Omega networks or Delta networks or Banyan networks. Um, but they're all sort of, at a high level, uh, they all sort of look the same. They're basically composed of these switching elements in the middle of the network. And we have, again, the inputs on the left and the outputs on the right. And in between the inputs and the outputs, these switching elements sort of move the traffic around on different links so it eventually gets um, from a source to a destination. And the way that these switches connect uh, gives various properties, for example, whether it's blocking or non-blocking, um, and, and different aspects such as path diversity. 
Okay, and then uh, another uh, sort of very common design, especially in more recent work, uh, and one that we talked about last time is the mesh. So remember, a mesh is basically just a 2D grid of nodes. And in this 2D grid, uh, or actually n-dimensional in general, so you can imagine a 3D mesh if you have 3D stacking, for example. But in general, so uh, at every point in this mesh, there's basically a processing element. So that's like a core, uh, a piece of the cache, maybe a memory controller. And that connects to a router. And all of these routers connect together just to their neighbors, so north, east, south, west, uh, for example. And when a packet moves, it just uh, moves through the mesh along these links. Um, and so the advantage of a mesh is that we get really good scalability because you only connect to your direct neighbors. You don't have uh, you know, global wires, for example, like you do in a crossbar. OK. So remember I talked about the distinction between direct and indirect networks. Uh, the distinction is basically that in an indirect network, we have the nodes, which are sort of the endpoints, right? The, the elements that uh, you know, packets are addressed to, so processors, cores, uh, cache slices. Um, and so the nodes in an indirect network are separate from the switching elements, right? So in a crossbar, for example, we have four nodes here. Um, and so they sort of have their sending half on the left and their receiving half on the bottom, if you will. Um, and the switching elements, which are these junction points, are separate from the nodes. Uh, and then the same is true for the multi-stage logarithmic networks, where we have the, um, the nodes on the far left and far right, and the switches are these separate things that are in between the nodes. Uh, in contrast, a direct network like a mesh actually has a piece of the network, so uh, one of the routers, associated with every node in the network. And in order for a packet uh, or a flit to move from one node to another, it actually traverses other nodes or other elements in the network. Right? So in a direct network, basically, an endpoint is the same as um, you know, any switching element or node in the network. OK, remember we talked about uh, blocking versus non-blocking. Um, so, and the difference here is that in a non-blocking network, any connection can be made independent of any other. So in a crossbar, uh, you can have essentially any permutation of the inputs on the left to the outputs on the bottom because we uh, we build every uh, junction point to allow every possible connection. In contrast, in many multi-stage logarithmic networks, the, the network is actually blocking. Because if you set up a certain pattern of connections in those links in the middle of the network, it will actually block other connections from happening. Right? And so because of this property, you need some way uh, for the network to actually either have some connections wait for other connections, right? Uh, so you could have, for example, some arbitration stage that says this link is already occupied. And so another connection can't be established until that link becomes free. Or you could have something like buffering in every stage of the, uh, in every stage of the tree or the network, um, where you actually sort of have traffic aggregate. And when there's contention, um, some of it waits in a buffer while the other traffic goes ahead. Um, and so just a, a follow up on, um, I think it was Birkin's question from Monday. So something like a mesh is blocking. It's considered blocking. Uh, because of the contention, which can cause packets to uh, require buffering. Um, and, and as we talked about on Monday a little bit, you can do other things there, too. You could deflect, for example. But it's still, uh, still considered blocking in that case. OK, and so just a few more things that we talked about. So we talked about cost. Um, remember, a crossbar is really expensive. So where n, n here is the number of nodes in the network. Uh, a crossbar is really expensive because for n nodes, we have every possible combination. Um, so that's you know, n choose 2, which is n, n plus 1 over 2, basically order n squared. Uh, right? So actually, it's exactly n squared uh, junction nodes here. Um, for a multi-stage logarithmic network, it's a little bit better. Um, the, the height, if you will, the, the, um, or I guess the width, uh, is still order n, because we have n nodes. And every node has um, you know, some input at every level of the tree. But it's only logarithmic depth, um, because we basically need uh, you know, one more level for every power of two increase in the number of nodes. And so it's overall n log n uh, cost, which is uh, obviously an asymptotic improvement uh, over the you know, crossbar. Um, but it's still not uh, ideal in terms of linear scaling. So a mesh is sort of the best we could hope for in terms of scaling, because it's actually linear. Uh, what, that, what that means effectively is there's some constant cost per node that you add. Right? So if you make your chip four times as big, you only have four times as much cost to your interconnect rather than four times some logarithmic factor. Um, of course, the cost for that is that you know, it's, it's lower performance than, say, a crossbar would be. 
And then finally, we talked about latency. So remember, latency is just the amount of time it takes for traffic to go from some source to some destination. Uh, a crossbar is, again, sort of the best case here. Um, it's the most performant option because you have a direct connection from every source to every destination. And so independent of whatever else is going on anywhere else in the network or in the crossbar, any source can send to a destination in constant time. You know, maybe it's a few cycles to arbitrate, one cycle to cross the fabric, um, one cycle to be received, you know, something like that. But it's, it's a small number of constant cycles. Multi-stage logarithmic network, on the other hand, is no longer constant because this network grows um, in terms of depth when we add more nodes. Uh, but it's not as bad as something like, uh, you know, a mesh. It's only log depth uh, because we have this, this um, sort of tree-like property. And so um, this is still fairly low latency and it's fairly constant latency. Um, blocking can add some delay because you, you might wait for a connection to be established, you know, or you might wait in a queue somewhere. So there could be queuing delay on top of that. Um, but the base latency is still pretty good. And then a mesh, uh, you know, gets a little bit worse because we no longer have this sort of, uh, you know, log tree structure. Now we actually have to, because it's a direct network, we have to traverse um, all of the nodes from source to destination. And so we actually have um, order square root n just simply because for um, n nodes, you know, it's square root n on a side if it's a 2D mesh, for example. Uh, 3D mesh, it would be cube root of n. Um, but basically, it's, it, um, the latency scales, um, you know, now a little bit higher than um, either of the more costly options. Of course, the trade-off, again, is that it's linear uh, scaling in terms of area and power. Um, so that, that's, um, you know, that's the trade-off you make. Okay, any questions on this? Any things that are unclear? Great. So uh, in the second half of Monday's lecture, we talked about flow control. Remember, flow control is basically the problem of if you have some uh, resources in the network, so uh, concretely, if you have things like links or buffer space, you need some way uh, for packets in the network to not conflict, right? So if two packets both require the same link to reach the destination, one of them can get the link, but the other packet needs to do something else. So sort of, uh, you know, a, a standard option is to keep that packet in a buffer. And the way that you manage that buffer space is part of your flow control solution. So we talked about a few different options that have been um, proposed and used in the past. And the most basic buffer-based flow control is store and forward. So remember, store and forward basically says we have buffer space in the network. And whenever a packet needs to move from one node to another, first it reserves an entire packet's worth of space in its next hop. Once it has that space reserved, then it can move to the next, uh, the next hop along its path. And then once it moves there, it can likewise reserve space in the next node and move one more hop so on and so forth. So basically, uh, you know, this is simple because all you have to do is you have to reserve space and then move the entire packet and then do it again. Um, the downside of this is that it's essentially a high um, serialization delay that's repeated with every hop, right? So uh, if this packet is, say, 100 flits long, right, the extreme case, but let's say it's really long, we would actually have to wait for, you know, order 100 cycles for the entire packet to move and do that for every hop. So it's simple, but that adds a lot of latency. Um, so sort of the uh, general class of uh, flow control that we talked about after that were cut through and then wormhole, which is an improvement on cut through. And the basic idea there is you want to pipeline things, right? So uh, we saw, so in store and forward, you have to wait for the entire packet to get to the next hop, right? Before it can move to the next hop and so on and so forth. If you do something like cut through, you can actually pipeline such that as soon as part of a packet is in one node, uh, the head of that packet can keep moving to its next hop, right? So uh, sort of in, in the um, you know, best case, the packet's basically spread over its entire path in the network, and uh, movement happens sort of at a flit granularity. And so you reduce latency to basically just a single serialization latency plus uh, a constant number of cycles per hop, independent of the packet length. And then, so the difference between cut through and wormhole, if you remember, is that uh, is in the way that you handle um, buffer reservation. With cut through, you have to reserve an entire packet's worth of space in a buffer, so that uh, if there's contention, the packet sort of um, you know recollects itself in a single buffer. Um, with wormhole, you can actually, uh, or you do actually allocate space at the flick granularity. And so, if there's contention, if there's blockage somewhere in the network, the packet can actually stop as it's spread over multiple nodes in the network. Um, the, the advantage of wormhole is that you get better buffer utilization. So it's, it's more efficient in that regard. Um, so then the final thing that we talked about was head of line blocking, right? So 
With wormhole, the problem is that if you have contention, and then the packet stops along its path in the network, it's actually occupying buffers along its entire path. And so we gave the example of like a, a turn lane, in a, you know, a left turn lane in the street, is sort of the analogy where um, a packet may be waiting for some output link in a router, and it's occupying buffers in that router, um, but it's actually blocking some other packet that could make forward progress if that packet weren't in the way. So here's the example we saw on Monday. Um, right, so the blue packet here is basically blocking this router um, in the top row because its buffer space here is full. But this red packet, which, which uh, wants to go to this destination here, actually can't move forward because it's blocked by the blue packet. Right? And so the solution that we had was to use virtual channels. So we saw how that worked on Monday. Basic idea is you just split FIFOs into multiple lanes, if you will, um, and a packet only occupies one lane. And so in this case, the blue packet will occupy that virtual channel on top, but the red packet can still pass the blue packet and make it to, it, to uh, its destination. Okay, so that's just a brief review on flow control. Are there any questions about what we talked about? Okay. I'm gonna go pretty fast today to try and get through stuff, but if you guys have any concerns or um, anything, just let me know. Um, okay, so the next thing we're gonna talk about is routing. Um, I mentioned on Monday the problem of routing in general is where you have a network with nodes, and if you have traffic from one node to another, say from node A to node B, routing is determining which links uh, that traffic will take to get from A to B, right? So if you have something like a mesh, if you have something like a mesh, you can imagine the routing function could get pretty interesting because there are a lot of different possibilities, right? Let's say that we have this four by two mesh and we have traffic being sent from node A to node B. Right, so there are actually, um, I guess, uh, three, let's see. There are four different possible paths here, right? Because we could go all the way over and then down. We could go all the way over here and then down like this. Could do this, we could do this. And the choice that we make uh, affects multiple things. It could affect performance because, say there's some contention in this router here, right? If we choose, if our routing function chooses to go all the way to the right and then down, we may hit contention here and be blocked, right? Say the, there is some other packet coming through this way and it blocks all the buffers in this router. Um, so it could affect performance. Uh, it could also affect latency. So, um, so, for, so in this lecture, I'm only gonna talk about what are called minimal routing algorithms, which are, they take sort of minimal length paths, right? So here, any path that's minimal would be four hops. But there are algorithms, for example, uh, that are called non-minimal algorithms, um, where uh, you could actually go up and around and down. And you might want to do that if, you know, say this entire region is congested. But if you do that, then you make a trade-off where you're actually adding hops to your path and so you're actually increasing baseline latency, right? So you're trading off sort of uncongested baseline latency for potentially avoiding uh, queuing delay in congested regions. Um, so the routing function that you choose can affect performance um, and it actually can also affect correctness and we'll get into that um, a little bit, I think, in this lecture. So you, you can imagine there could be deadlock cases if you uh, choose to route sort of in a bad way. Um, I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Okay, um, so there are a few different um, sort of broad uh, um, strategies, if you will, to route in a network, right? And so the first one, and this is sort of the, the most commonly used and uh, maybe the simplest to think about is arithmetic routing. So the idea with uh, arithmetic routing is that um, you basically want to define a function that given a source and a destination and where you are currently, or maybe just where you are currently in a destination, it's some deterministic function that tells you where you need to go next, right? So a simple example that I could define on a mesh is actually one of the most commonly used. It's called XY routing. So the way that XY routing works, and actually the generalization to multiple dimensions is called uh, dimension order routing, but in 2D it's XY or YX. Um, the way that XY routing works is you basically say, I have in this mesh an X coordinate and a Y coordinate, right? And so what I'm going to do is if I need to go from here to here, first I'm going to traverse in the X direction until I reach my X coordinate. And then once I'm in my X coordinate, so in other words, once I'm in the proper column for my destination, then I'm going to traverse in my Y direction to reach my Y coordinate. So in, in general, you can imagine if you have, 
you know, an n vector of, of uh, coordinates, you basically reach your, your destination by reaching one coordinate dimension at a time. Um, and so this is, you know, nice. It's easy to define. Basically, in hardware, all you need is a few comparators to look at your destination address and say, am I in the proper column? If not, figure out if I need to go left and right. If I am, figure out if I need to go up or down. Um, you know, so it's simple, and it's actually, it turns out it's pretty easy to reason about, too, in terms of uh, deadlock, which is a nice advantage. But um, so arithmetic routing works well um, when you have sort of these regular topologies where you can actually define sort of this logical function on how to get to your destination. Um, okay, but you can imagine that there are cases where that might not work so well. So for example, if I take this mesh, and let's say that there's some failure in the hardware. So let's say that this link goes away, right? Maybe it's a, it's a wire that gradually degrades in, in uh, hardware or something. Uh, so this network is still fully connected, right? I can still get to any node from any other. Um, performance will be slightly degraded because my bisection bandwidth just got cut in half. Um, but it's still fully connected. So we should be able to route from any A to any B. Uh, but if we try something like XY routing, obviously it's not going to work. Because if I try and go from A to B, I go this way and I hit this broken link. And then what do I do? So you can imagine there could be ways where I could try and get around this by defining my arithmetic routing function in a smarter way. right? So I could say, um, go in the X direction until you hit a broken link. But then if you do hit a broken link, try and do something else. Maybe skirt the boundary of a broken region and then come around the other side. But that also gets sort of complicated to reason about because then you have to think about you know, the corner cases. What if, um, you know, what if it's not concave in that example, right? Uh, or convex, I guess. Um, so, so that gets messy. So, um, so actually, OK, I'm going out of order here. I'm uh, going to talk about table lookup. But the sort of the generalization that you can make is if you can't define a nice, easy routing function, um, that's you know, based on a logic function like an arithmetic routing, you can actually do something called um, table lookup based routing. Um, so the basic idea with table lookup based routing is you basically say at every router for any given destination, I have a table that tells me which output to use for that destination. So you can think of this as more like in a conventional TCP IP network. You have some number of network interfaces on a router, and you have some routing table that says this network goes here, this network goes here. Right? Uh, the idea here is the same. Uh, you can imagine I would have, for example, a routing table at A that says um, maybe to go to this node, take this link, but for any other node, take this downward link because I want to eventually avoid this broken link, right? And then here, my routing table would say, okay, for anything in the right half of the network, you can't go right, you have to go down because this link is broken. So in general, you can basically construct these tables that say for whatever destination, take this output. And you, know, you can imagine ways to build this efficiently in hardware. Maybe you have like a, you know, a cam that uh, is you know, prefix matching based. Maybe you have just a, you know, all possible combinations table. But uh, the basic idea is that you have a table, and so that way it's more flexible. Um, that gives some other advantages as well. So you, if you use tables, you can do things like dynamic reconfiguration, uh, where you could actually say, based on the congestion that I see in the network, every n cycles, I'm going to reconfigure my whole network and try and like, shift traffic away from congested regions. Uh, or rebalance routes or something like that. Um, so that can be nice. Um, OK. And then there's uh, the final scheme, which is called source-based. And so this is just sort of a middle point between the two. So arithmetic is based on um, I'm at a current location, and then I know where my destination is. And so I have a function of those two parameters, which tells me where to go, my output port. Uh, source-based is basically saying, um, basically based on the source, so based on where I came from. So even if I'm in the middle of the network, uh, I know that I came from A, and so I have some function that says when I come from A and I go to B, I want to go in this direction. So it's sort of a, just another way to specify the function. Um, but sort of the two distinctions, that, or the two categories that I'll make a distinction between here are the function-based, so you know, things that can be built in logic, and then the table-based, which are just a lookup table that tells you where to go. OK, does that uh, make sense to everyone? OK, I guess there are some pros and cons here, too. Um, OK. Sorry, so actually, so source-based, uh, so it's a little bit different. Um, OK, so the way the source-based actually, actually works is um, when you send a packet into the network, you actually append um, some routing information. So it could be in the header, it could be in a footer, that says, uh, this packet is going here, and here are the list of hops that it needs to take. right? And so 
Uh, for example, if you have seven hops in the network max, you could have um, a seven element field in your header that says, here are the next seven routers to go to. And so basically at each router, you just look at the first destination and you route to that next hop and then you peel off that next hop. And so the next router will see the next hop and so on and so forth. Um, so, sorry, actually, um, yeah, that's what it actually is. Um, I misdescribed that. Anyway, so yeah, so that's source based and then there's table lookup. Um, and so the advantage of, of source-based is that you can be flexible at the source. You can pre-compute any arbitrary route, um, but it takes extra space in your packet. Um, Table-based has the advantage that you have a small header. It's just the destination, um, but you need these lookup tables at every, at every node. Okay, and then, yeah, more complex switches. Okay, so there are a few different uh, types of routing algorithm as well, right? So, um, and th this is sort of orthogonal to the uh, way that you compute the route. So orthogonal to whether it's arithmetic, whether it's uh, source-based, or whether it's table-based, uh, the route that you take can have various properties. So uh, the simplest is deterministic, which means for any given source destination pair, so any time I go from node A to node B, I always take the same route. So XY routing is an example of a deterministic routing algorithm because it's just a function of uh, you know, A and B, basically. Um, this is nice, basically, because it's simple. Um, and because you don't have to worry about things like dynamic load balancing, right? Um, so there's another uh, sort of um, option here, which is that say that uh, I have a network where some routes are um, or can be more loaded than others, right? So say that uh, in this mesh, I sometimes get hotspots where um, maybe this is a memory controller here. So maybe this is, you know, connects to DRAM. And a lot of traffic often comes here. Um, so if I just have sort of a, um, a deterministic XY algorithm or any deterministic algorithm, maybe there are some nodes that are talking to the memory controller and they'll congest certain paths, right? Um, so you want to do something that sort of spreads the load. So a nice way to do that is something called oblivious routing where I don't take the same path every time. I try and spread my traffic over multiple paths, but I don't do it in the way that's, um, that requires tracking information about the network. I just do it in some random way. Right, so um, I, I, um, I think that uh, in a few slides I'll talk about uh, Valiant routing, which is actually an example of oblivious routing. The basic idea in something like Valiant routing is you basically, from your starting point, pick a random middle point. So say I have a node here that wants to talk to this node here, um, and it's sending a fairly heavy flow, so a lot of packets. Uh, what it'll do if it's doing oblivious routing is it'll actually pick a random middle point. So say this node here. And it'll send the traffic there with some information on it that says, I'm just sending this to you to bounce it off of you, and the final destination is here. Right? And so once the packet gets to this node here, it'll actually be resent, or sort of you know, bounced, if you will, back to the final destination. And so the key insight with something like this is that if you pick this random middle point um, in, a, in a sort of a smart way, so say that um, well, you know, in general, if I have the whole network that's congested, if I pick the, the random middle point um, sort of randomly, but, you know, you can imagine you can do this in the nearby region or something like that, um, you actually spread the traffic around by using different paths. Um, so that's one example of an ob oblivious routing algorithm. But in general, the idea is you try and spread traffic, but you do it in a way that doesn't require tracking network state. Okay, and then the final scheme is also... Um, trying to spread traffic, but uh, so adaptive routing basically does this in a smart way. So there have been uh, proposals over um, sort of the last n years where you basically look at the network and you somehow track congestion in the network, right? So uh, let's say that we have this network and we have this hotspot still at this memory controller. Uh, we could have some, say, counters on all of these routers in the network, and these counters could somehow detect, okay, this path here, uh, is getting a lot more traffic than the other nearby routers. And so I know that this path is somehow congested. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to somehow, um, you know, say, say some traffic gets here and I would have sent it on this congested path. Somehow I can dynamically choose to take a different path. And so the idea there is you basically give each router some notion of what the network state looks like. So, you know, either how congested its immediate links are to its neighbors or how congested uh, the regions are around it, or how congested the whole network is, and you let the router dynamically choose which route to take based on that information. So again, it's, it's usually uh, you know, congestion-based information. 
Um, it doesn't have to be. So you could be adaptive for faults, for example. Uh, again, if you have that link in the middle missing, uh, the router might adaptively detect that and you know, take a different route, something like that. Um, but that, that's the basic idea. Uh, okay, so I mentioned a few different options. So how do you adapt? You could do it based on local feedback. Again, if you just know locally how many, uh, you know, how many packets or flits have I sent over my immediate links to neighbors in the last 10 cycles, and then sort of use that as a proxy for how congested are the regions in that direction. Um, you could have global feedback, so routers could coordinate with each other, right, or co could coordinate with a central uh, sort of controller of some sort that says, okay, I'm going to aggregate st uh, statistics from the entire network and figure out this half is more congested than this half, so I'm going to try and shift traffic over the other way. Um, you know, so you, or you could have some combination of those. Uh, and then, so I mentioned uh, just uh, a few minutes ago, minimal versus non-minimal. Um, minimal means, uh, again, that you basically can take any path as long as it's the same number of hops um, as, the, as the, you know, the deterministic path. So basically, minimize the number of hops. Um, so in a mesh, you know, it's just the Manhattan, Manhattan distance. Um, but non-minimal can actually uh, buy you some performance in some cases because even though you go a little bit longer uh, statically, so your path is a little bit longer, you actually have less queuing delay because you're avoiding congested regions. Okay, so I guess I sort of, I went through all of this already, so I'm going to skip over this. So just an example of XY routing. So the Cray T3D uh, was, I believe, an alpha-based system, and basically the, the processors were connected in a torus, I think a 3D torus, um, and so it used XY, uh, dimension order routing. Um, it may have been a 2D torus, I don't remember. Uh, anyway, you can look that up. But the, the, the Cray used uh, deterministic routing. Right, so it's simple. Um, there's deadlock freedom, and I'll, um, if we have time, I'll talk about why. Uh, downsides is that it could lead to high contention, again, because you could have these sort of static hot um, paths because of um, you know, some flows having more traffic than other flows. And so it doesn't exploit path diversity, which could solve that problem. OK, so I actually touched on this a little bit on Monday, but just to give a little bit um, more detail and to, to uh, remind you. So deadlock happens when I have resources that have cyclic dependencies in general, right? And so in a knock, deadlock can happen when I have uh, traffic and buffers where all the buffers are full and the traffic in each buffer requires some space in the next buffer in a cycle to make forward progress. So the simplest example, let's say I have these four routers that are sort of just adjacent neighbors here in a mesh, let's say, and I have uh, packets in the, in the input buffers in each router that uh, want to go to the next router in a cycle. So it's a counterclockwise cycle in this case, right? And so if all the, if all the buffers are full, uh, then none of the packets can allocate space at the next buffer in their path, and so none of the packets will move. But because none of the packets are moving, none of the space will ever free up, and so we have a deadlock, right? And so the way that we can handle this, uh, so one way we can handle this is actually avoiding cycles and routing. Um, and so I mentioned virtual channels as one solution. It's actually a, sort of a more advanced solution, but you can actually solve this just by tweaking the routing function. And the way you do this is you actually um, change your routing function such that uh, you restrict some turns. And by turns, I mean, you know, let's say at a router you come in from the west and you go to the south. Um, you restrict some turns such that there are no cycles in the possible paths you can take. Um, and so that, so uh, I think we'll get another example of that in the next slide. And you actually, I believe, have a paper on this as well. I don't think it's required. Uh, Turn-based model, it's ISCA 92, glass and knee. Um, but basically, so, so the idea there is you, you remove some turns from the possible path so you never have a deadlock. Um, OK, and then I talked on Monday how you can also solve this problem with virtual channels. That's sort of a more performance solution, assuming you can, you can afford the buffers. And the idea here is you just have um, sort of separate classes of virtual channels such that uh, you know, if you make certain transitions, for example, one, one common scheme is if you cross a certain horizon or date line in the network, you can transition from, say, pool 0 to pool 1, but not pool 1 to pool 0. So you remove cycles by uh, restricting which virtual channels you can move between instead of which turns. Uh, and then the final option is um, just detecting deadlock. So just being optimistic, saying it probably won't happen or won't happen that often. But if it does, I can detect it maybe by seeing, OK, packets haven't moved for so many cycles. Maybe there's a timeout you know, of some sort or a watchdog, and then you can basically somehow break it, either by draining the network into some special side buffers 
um, or by you know, preempting something uh, so that you can get the network moving again. Uh, but just to go into a little more detail on uh, the first option, which is turn-based. So, right, so this is the paper, um, a fairly fundamental uh, idea, a fairly basic idea, um, which is basically you look at, so you can consider the, uh, the, the network as having what's called a channel dependence graph. And the Dali paper talks about this. Um, the channel dependence graph is basically if every uh, buffer in the network is a node in a graph, then you can draw an arc, a directed arc between nodes for... Uh, any transition that can happen with a packet. So if a packet can move from one buffer to another directly, say over a channel, uh, then you can draw an arc between those nodes. And if that directed graph has any cycles, then you, uh, you get deadlock, potentially. And so the idea here is just to remove um, turns that you can make. So a turn connects one buffer to another, right, input buffers. Uh, remove turns such that you don't have deadlock. Um, okay. And so, so there are some examples here. Um, um, you know, you can sort of form these figure eight type things where if you want to make, um, you know, a, a right turn, for example, maybe you have to go around and do a three-stage left turn instead, um, but that actually removes the, the cycles um, in the network. So you can read the paper for more details there. Okay, I guess I'm doing an uh, out-of-order issue here, but uh, so valiance I already talked about. Um, and it's an example of an ob oblivious algorithm, and the goal is to balance load. Um, so basically, you randomly sort of distribute paths by choosing these random intermediate points. So it balances network load. Um, downside, of course, is that it's non-minimal, right? So you pick this random node that could be way out of your way. And so that adds to your uh, baseline latency because it adds hops. Um, so you could increase, you could increase packet latency, um, you know, in the worst case, if, if that isn't traded off for um, lower network contention. Um, so you, you could sort of get around that with a few optimizations. You could only turn it on at high load, for example. That's sort of the most basic thing. Um, and you could also sort of be smarter about the intermediate node. So, um, right, so you could pick an intermediate node that's maybe fairly close to your destination in the same region, for example. Okay, adaptive routing. Um, so I mentioned there are sort of these two different classes of routing in general. Um, and in adaptive routing specifically, uh, minimal, non-minimal, based on whether you take the minimum number of hops or more than the minimum. Um, and so, okay, I guess, yeah, I've sort of covered this too. Uh, basically, you just, you look at the network state and you say, I know where there's congestion, uh, or I can guess where there's congestion, predict where there's congestion, and I'm going to route traffic in such a way that I avoid the congestion, if, if possible. Um, Okay, and then so, right, so, uh, so it could be, you know, still productive ports, so productive means toward your destination, or it could be non-minimal. Okay. Um, okay, and then I mentioned this as well. So adaptive routing also helps you avoid faulty links, um, right? So that's sort of the basic idea is, is right around faults. Um, and so, so this is a little bit strong. I think deterministic routing can handle faulty components if you design the, um, if you give the packet some state, right? So you could say um, that deterministically I can sort of um, follow the edge of a region that's been removed from my network. Um, but it gets really tricky to think about and it's really hard to prove that it works correctly. Um, so, so basically if you want to do something like this, you probably need to have something like routing tables where you say, I know that this link is bad, so I'm going to change the routes for all the paths around that link such that I can sort of, um, you know, patch around it in the network. Um, okay, so that was a super fast whirlwind tour of routing. Any confusions or questions, thoughts? All right, awesome. Let's talk about router design. So, so far I've given you the picture of a router basically as a black box. We went a little bit into it on Monday when we saw um, you know, a virtual channel router with the buffers inside of it. Um, but uh, let's go a little bit deeper now. So let's look at a single router. Um, so the first thing, so uh, there are different types of buffering in routers. So you, you'll hear about input buffered routers, output buffered routers. There are also routers with buffers in the middle. Um, basically that means when a packet comes into a, to a router, is it buffered first and then uh, arbitrated toward its output? Or does it go through some sort of arbitration and crossbar first and then buffered at the router output? Um, or is it buffered at some intermediate point in the pipeline? Um, sort of the most common choice, uh, and for a few reasons that I'll talk about, is input buffering. 
which means when a packet comes in to a router, first it's placed in a buffer, and then there's some routing and arbitration where eventually it'll leave the buffer and cross a crossbar inside the router. The reason you do input buffering is in order to uh, give a better worst case, right? So in the worst case, um, only one flit can come into a router input per cycle, which means you really only need effectively five FIFOs with one write port per FIFO, um, if you think about the hardware implementation. But if you do something like output buffering, for example, in the worst case, all of the flits that come into a router in one cycle might head toward the same router output. So what that means is that if, you're, if you don't have any capacity for buffering until the router output, you actually need to handle the case where all five flits, or say you know, n flits for an n input router, can come in in the same cycle. So right, we have n inputs. We actually need to handle the case where all of these go toward a single output. So we need redundant data, path, data paths to handle this. And then we need some large wide FIFO here that can actually write n flits into it in the same cycle. So we need a lot of write ports in the same FIFO. Right? So that's the reason we do input buffering, because we basically have this guarantee that on a given input, we'll only get one flit per cycle. So essentially, all uh, recent router designs are designed this way. And so I mentioned uh, virtual channels on Monday. Uh, you, can, you can design a virtual channel router where the virtual channels are actually separate FIFOs, which is sort of what this figure implies here. And in that case, you have something like a D multiplexer in front of the FIFOs and a multiplexer uh, behind them. You could also design it such that this is like a single SRAM, and then you have virtual FIFOs within it, you know, based on um, interleaving or uh, address ranges or something. Um, not really fundamental, but basically you have these buffer structures um, at, that are independent at every input. OK, and then once you buffer the traffic, eventually you'll decide, OK, this flit needs to go to this router output uh, on toward its next hop. And so in order to, uh, to affect that, in order to make that happen, you have um, basically a, something like a crossbar. Um, so this could be just literally a full n by n crossbar. It could be some more efficient you know, sort of sparse data path, like a you know, log step network or something, an uh, indirect network. But basically, you have uh, some data path that connects the input buffers to all of the router outputs. So if traffic arrives from any input, it can get to any output. And then on the side of that, you have basically the control logic. And so what this does is it's a few different um, sort of, uh, so there are a few different functions I'll talk about, uh, routing, arbitration, all of that stuff. But the basic idea is when traffic comes in, you need to figure out where it needs to go first, so that's routing. And then you need to allocate the resources downstream to let it go there. So that's sort of arbitration and allocation. So I'll talk about each of these components. Uh, any questions? OK, so yeah, so I'll talk about buffering first, then I'll talk about route computation. So basically, as I mentioned, flits come in, they get buffered first. And then once you get a flit, you do route computation, which is evaluation of your routing function to say, where does this flit or this packet need to go next? Um, once you've done route computation, you need to basically arbitrate for the resources to let the packet get there. Um, so that's, um, uh, if you will, packet scheduling. Basically, if you have multiple packets that contend, the question is which packet goes first. Uh, and then once you decide that uh, the flit or the packet can move on to the next top, you have switching, so that's the crossbar. Uh, and then there are some other aspects as well you can think about. So for example, if you want to be energy efficient, you could do something like scaling link and router frequency. Um, but that's sort of orthogonal to the rest of these. Um, well, I guess not quite. If you turn off a link, that, that matters. But, um, so I won't, I won't talk about that too much, though, uh, in this talk. Okay, so sort of a canonical uh, buffered router, or virtual channel buffered router pipeline uh, shown here. And so these are logical stages. Um, in the next few slides, I'll talk about how they can be combined and made speculative to make the pipeline shorter. Um, but this is what we'll start with. So there are sort of five logical steps, and this corresponds to what I just talked about on the previous slide. Um, first, you have buffer write. So when traffic comes in, it's written to an input buffer. And then once you have the traffic, you do route computation. Once you know where it's going, you do virtual channel allocation. So what this means is that at a given router, you actually allocate space in the virtual channel in the packet's next hop. So this isn't allocating space in the virtual channel in this router. It's allocating space in the virtual channel in the next router. Um, sorry, actually allocating a virtual channel, uh, not space in a virtual channel. Um, once, you, once you have that space downstream, you know that the packet can basically move on because um, you, know, you know that it has a place to go, basically. And then when it moves on, you'll take it with, uh, with, a, with a virtual channel identifier. So in the input buffer in the next router, it just goes straight into that virtual channel. So, so you can think of this as 
um, your pipelining virtual channel allocation by, uh, by one hop, where you actually allocate um, ahead. Uh, okay, so once you have that, then you, um, you do switch allocation. So what that means is you, you know, there, there could be contention for the crossbar input ports. For example, if you have multiple packets from a given input port and multiple virtual channels ready to go in the same cycle, um, and so you have to allocate for that, and also for the switch outputs. So I'll talk about how that works. And then once you have the data path allocated um, across the crossbar, then you actually traverse it. Um, so, lot, so concretely, you know, that can happen in parallel with other things, but logically it's still a, a separate step. Um, and then once you traverse a switch, then usually we consider um, link traversal. So that's the links between the routers as a separate pipeline stage just because um, of you know, latency reasons. It's hard to make that happen in the same, same clock cycle as, uh, as the crossbar traversal. Um, so logically, there are these six separate uh, steps. Five of them make up the router, and then one is the link between routers. Um, but as we will soon see, you can actually combine some of these to make it shorter. Okay, so the first thing to realize is that if we have something like a wormhole router, I remember in a wormhole router, once a packet starts to come in from one input and go to an output, it actually continues moving from that input to that output of the router until the entire packet goes through. And so this is what gives us the situation where you sort of have this packet you know, spread out along its path in the network um, because it actually it maintains those connections along the entire path. Um, so. Uh, you know, this had the performance effects we talked about where it can block other packets, but it also has this nice effect where in the router, we actually only need to route computation once for the head flit or the, you know, the first flit in the packet. And then once we do that, we can basically um, save the routing decision and keep this connection as sticky from input to output. Um, so the route compute and the virtual channel allocation actually only need to happen once um, for a given packet, right? Uh, and so... This, so this doesn't help us with, with latency at all because you know, the, the body flits and the tail flit are going to come in after the head flit. So we can't, you know, we can't hide this latency or we can't uh, shrink the total time. But this does help us um, in terms of uh, energy, for example. Um, and yeah, OK. Okay, so let's talk about uh, sort of these, these tasks that the router needs to do at a um, sort of um, abstract level now. So first, uh, basically you can think of what happens when a flick comes in or when a packet comes in as decode. So we look at the routing information, uh, figure out what type of packet it is, what needs to happen, and then routing. So we figure out, okay, this is this destination. It needs to go out the north output port, for example. Once we know where it needs to go, then there is basically this, um, this switch arbitration stage where we say, okay, it needs to allocate the data path through the router to get to the output. And then there's the actual data path, so actually traversing the switch. Um, and so uh, we can actually consider in a virtual channel router a little more concretely, uh, the switch arbitration becomes two separate steps, as I just mentioned. There's virtual channel allocation, and then there's switch arbitration. So you allocate the buffer space in the next hop first. Once you have that buffer space, then you arbitrate for the switch. But we can actually make a few of these things speculative, right? So we can actually assume that there will be space in the downstream router. So there will be a free virtual channel in the downstream router. And just go ahead and arbitrate for access to the switch to get downstream in parallel to allocating the virtual channel. So now that we've introduced speculation, this is, you know, speculation is a general concept. Um, if you speculate and you're wrong, you need some way to recover, right? And so in this case, what recovery means is, you know, we've allocated access to the switch. But if we don't actually have space in the virtual channel downstream, we just don't use the switch, right? So we'll just abort the, uh, abort the switch um, traversal. Uh, so in this case, the cost of the speculation is potentially that we have more uh, switch contention than we would have if we actually serialized VC and switch arbitration. But the benefit, which is uh, in most cases much larger, is that you actually reduce the, the pipeline uh, depth in the router. So you reduce the router latency by one cycle. Um, so essentially, um, you know, most or all modern virtual channel routers do something like this. Okay. Um, so basically, so this the switch arbitration um, is just allocating access to the switch. But if you know that there won't be buffer space at the end of this cycle, you just don't send the flit across the, the crossbar. Yeah, so it's like an empty bubble, basically. Okay, um, 
So, okay, so that was the first optimization. Um, the second optimization, so we consider this buffer write as sort of a separate stage, right? Where something comes in, we stick it in the buffer first before we do anything else, and then once it's safe in the buffer, we start to think about it, you know, we compute its route, we allocate space, uh, we arbitrate space downstream for it, all of that stuff. But we, we can actually, you know, this is sort of trivial, overlap route compute with a buffer write. So in parallel to writing um, the head flit into the buffer, we, we can go ahead and look at the head flit and start computing where it needs to go. Um, Right, so we can, we can do that in parallel as well. And then the next optimization we can do, um, okay, so this is the, the parallel virtual or VC allocation I just talked about. Um, right, so basically if it's not successful, you just need to re, you know, try again in the next cycle. Um, and so this, this gives us a pipeline that's only three stages long. And then the final optimization that we can do is that we can actually, um, bypass the uh, virtual channel allocation route computation and directly arbitrate for the switch um, if there's nothing in the buffer. So this is called empty buffer bypassing. Um, it gives us latency uh, advantages. It also actually gives us um, uh, energy advantages. It means we can completely turn off the buffer uh, when load is low, and th you know, so that helps us out in terms of power consumption. Um, but basically, we can, we can do that as well. So um, I went really fast through that as well. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna talk just a few more slides on sort of this high level um, stuff on network performance metrics and on-chip, off-chip interconnect. Um, then I'll uh, you know, ask if there are any questions and I can sort of give, an, give a review of any of the interconnect stuff. Um, and then after that, I'll launch into the um, sort of recent research. Um, so network performance. So sort of the uh, canonical performance graph that you'll see in any on-chip network or any interconnect paper is this uh, what's called a load delay curve. So the basic idea of such a plot is on the x-axis, you have the offer traffic. So this means the amount of uh, data you're injecting into the network per unit time, per second, um, or per clock cycle. And on the y-axis is the latency. So this is the amount of time that a single flit or packet in the network takes to get from source to destination. And so the idea here is that if you have low offer traffic, um, you'll have essentially some baseline latency, right? And so this is basically just the latency it takes to get from one node to another in the network without any contention at all. But as you, as you basically push more bits into the network, um, it creates more contention because packets bump into each other. Um, you know, some packets need to wait for other packets in buffers. And so gradually your queuing delay takes over and you start to get more latency. And then in the limit, eventually you'll, you'll hit this point where basically the network saturates. And so this is where the latency curve shoots up. Um, and that's where your offer traffic um, is approaching the actual network design capacity. So, you know, in the best case, if you have a one flit width uh, into the network at every router, that would be, um, you know, one flit worth of bits per cycle um, per node. Um, usually it saturates below that because there are inefficiencies in the network, right? There are overheads with things like head flits, there's overhead with routing, um, there's overhead with, you know, contention effects that make it non-perfect, but there, there should be some point where the network saturates. Um, so let's look, uh, look at this in a little more detail. So if you consider just the, the network at a very abstract level, you have nodes and you have wires between nodes, there's actually some minimal latency from any point to any other based just on the topology, right? So if we have this mesh here, uh, and I want to get traffic from, again, from A to B, there's some latency that would be determined just by crossing this wire, this wire, this wire, and this wire, independent of the routers, right? And so that's sort of the best we could hope to do for unless we build some different, latent, uh, some different topology or unless we use, you know, different faster wires um, or break the speed of light or something like that. Um, okay, but there's, so the next step we can take is there's a little more uh, reasonable or re realistic bound, which is actually the minimum latency given by the routing algorithm, right? So here when I talked about minimum latency given by the topology, this was sort of assuming, uh, you know, shortest path um, from A to B. But if we do something like, uh, you know, the turn-based deadlock avoidance, or if we do something like um, adaptive routing, there's actually another minimum latency, which is um, I may not take, you know, the best path in terms of latency at, at any given point. Um, so that, that's just another bound that could be different. And then the final bound um, is when we sort of consider the actual network design, right? So before I was just talking about topology, um, but now uh, this is topology and um, uh, routing and flow control, right? So now we're actually considering how the router pipeline works, how flow control works, 
and the time taken to, for example, allocate buffers, uh, enter buffers, leave buffers, um, and go through the whole router pipeline. And so this is um, sometimes known as zero load latency, which, which basically just means if the network has zero load, so if there are no other packets in the network, how long on average does it take for one packet to reach from um, one node to another, right, for any two nodes in the network? Um, and so this is sort of the, the realistic lower bound you can expect. And then as the load increases, you, you go up above zero load latency. Uh, use all of the wires uh, in every cycle. Um, all right, you guys will hear me in stereo now. Uh, use all, so use all of the wires in every cycle and basically keep them busy, right? Um, and so, of course, that's not realistic because, again, we have these overheads in terms of, um, you know, going through the routers and we have these overheads in terms of non-perfect routing um, and flow control and so on and so forth. So the next best thing we can hope for is the throughput given by the routing function. Again, the, the distinction there is just we may take different paths. Um, and so, you know, that could be a little bit lower. And then the final, and this is the realistic actual upper bound, is the throughput given by the flow control. So once we consider things like buffer allocation and, uh, you know, the way we arbitrate for contention, um, there's some realistic upper bound that we can achieve. And so typically you'll see in a buffered network this saturation point uh, is something like 0.6 or 0.7 flits per node per cycle, where one one flip per node per cycle would be the, you know, the optimum. Um, so if you have, you know, if you design your buffering strategy well, if you design your routing well, you can get fairly reasonable uh, efficiency, but it's not going to be perfect efficiency because you have these, these overheads. Um, just to go into a little more depth, so what is the ideal latency? The ideal latency is basically solely wires, right? So um, uh, basically, we can consider the Manhattan distance, so, you know, if we're in a 2D mesh, Manhattan distance is just X distance and Y distance um, between two nodes, and we take some propagation velocity, so this is, you know, some fraction of the speed of light in copper wires or something, uh, and basically, if we take distance over velocity, we get time just to travel that distance, and then on top of that, we have what's called uh, serialization latency, which is basically how long is the packet uh, and how many bits per second can we push. Um, and so there's some amount of time it takes just to get the last bit of the packet out the sender, and we add that on top of the propagation, right? So that's the best we could hope for. But if we look at the actual latency, of course, it's, it's much higher. So we have the initial two terms, which are, um, you know, the, the um, optimal, just based on, you know, basically speed of light and the speed of our link. Uh, and then on top of that, we have the number of hops and then the time we spend in each router. Um, plus uh, the time due to contention, right? So you can consider all of the terms except for the last one. So this, um, you know, so remember again, this is speed of light term, this is serialization delay, and this is time per hop. Uh, if we take just those three terms, that's a zero load latency. That's basically if nothing else ever contends, then all I have is time on the wires and time in the routers per router. Um, but then finally, if we have contention, uh, you know, then basically sometimes one packet needs to wait in a buffer because some other packet uh, is using the link that that packet wants to use. Uh, and so this is basically queuing delay, this, this TC. Um, and so when you add all of those together, you get some realistic latency that the network actually offers, um, and that will increase with network load. Okay, any questions on that? Good. Um, so, there, uh, so there are a few different... Uh, you know, concrete metrics you can care about. So packet latency is one. You can, again, you can think about zero load latency. You can think about latency in a realistic system with a realistic load. Um, round trip latency is, uh, in rough terms, basically two packet latencies. Um, but this matters for things like coherence protocols, for example, where, you know, you request some data and then the data has to come back. So you care about the, the time for basically two, uh, two packet transitions or uh, uh, two packet transactions. Um, saturation throughput is just basically the maximal throughput you can push through the network realistically. So that's basically the point where the, where the, um, the load delay curve uh, peaks um, or, or shoots to infinity. Um, and then application level performance. And so this is sort of 
a high level. You know, so far we've talked about interconnects as sort of these um, you know, uh, uh, things that connect with these black box processing elements. But in the end, you know, if you're designing the computer, you care about how fast the application runs, not how many packets you're pushing through the network. Um, and so application performance is affected by network performance, potentially. Um, you know, if, you're, if your system uses the on-chip network to connect to memory, for example, um, but it's not necessarily linearly coordinate, uh, correlated, for example. It could be some, you know, maybe you need some amount of bandwidth, but then after a certain point, the network bandwidth doesn't matter, um, or something like that. Um, and so it's also affected by things like interference, where you know, one, one thread is close to another thread, uh, and maybe you know, in terms of processing elements, and maybe it uh, causes packet interference or something like that. So we'll see more of that, actually, um, in the second half of today, which I'm about to get to. Um, OK, last thing I want to talk about. So, so far, we've talked about interconnects sort of abstractly um, in the sense of we have networks, uh, sorry, we have routers, we have links between them. Um, in, re in modern or recent network designs, this has been on chip, right? So we have chip multiprocessors, and there's something like a mesh interconnect um, on the CMP. But conventionally, interconnects have actually been designed for off-chip designs. And so this is you know, something like uh, John Ike Patel's paper in 1979. On through the 80s, we had things like the you know, Caltech Cosmic Cube that were these big physical systems built out of racks of boards, and they had the links that were actually long wires between them. Um, so you can, you can think of this contrast where we have these um, you know, fundamentals that are the same, but the, uh, sort of the context and the details of the two environments are very different. So if you think of on-chip networks, um, actually this is sort of interesting. So uh, wires are essentially free, right? So, uh, and this is in, in uh, comparison to an off-chip network. So in, basically in an off-chip network, so if you have a bunch of boards and you're building an interconnect between them with these long uh, wires, wires are really expensive, right? Because they take up space. Um, they're, exp you know, they're, they're costly in terms of the materials, so copper is expensive. Um, but on-chip, basically you have a lot of physical area, and typically your wiring layers are above like your local logic layers, right? So you have many metal layers on a, a silicon process. And so interconnect wires are typically uh, essentially almost free, like you're limited by other things before you're limited by wires. And so when you look at on-chip networks, you'll see very wide links. Um, just to give some concrete examples, so uh, Sandy Bridge is one of the recent Intel processors, um, and it's, it uses rings, so it uses a ring interconnect. The ring is 256 bits wide. Um, Right, so that, that's very wide considering what you would build in an off-chip network. You would never see um, an off-chip link between two boards that was 256 wires wide. Right? Even, even DRAM is only 64 bits wide, and that's considered expensive. Um, so that's one, one uh, sort of trade-off that can be made. Uh, you know, uh, leads to different design points in on-chip networks. Uh, another thing is that there's very low latency. So if you consider conventional networks like uh, off-chip interconnects or even more extreme, something like the internet, latencies are measured in microseconds or milliseconds. On-chip, you typically have latencies that are only a few clock cycles, uh, right? So maybe, in the worst case, 50 or 100 clock cycles to cross the entire chip. So that's, um, you know, order 5, 10 microseconds. Uh, and so because of that, that, that affects a few things. First, it means that um, uh, basically you can't do very complex things, right? So your routing functions need to be really simple, need to be decided in just a few cycles. Um, it also means that uh, these networks are essentially very um, important for performance because they're involved in low latency activities. For example, a cache miss, you want to take not more than a few hundred cycles. Uh, and if you build your chip multiprocessor such that the NOC is the uh, backbone of the memory system, you actually have a full packet round trip on the critical path for every cache miss. Um, so you both need low latency, uh, and you also you typically design for it by building basically very simple router pipelines. Um, and then finally, uh, so this, you know, this is not true in some research, but in most research and in most real systems, you basically assume that packets aren't dropped and links don't fail, right? And if they do, then it's a catastrophic thing and you throw your chip away. Um, so, you, you know, this is not uh, exactly true at the very lowest level. So you can consider things like forward error correction, where maybe you send some, uh, you know, some uh, ECC block at the end of your packet, um, on a real link where you could actually correct a few bit flips. Um, but at the, you know, at the router level, you basically you don't design for packets that drop. Um, maybe in the worst case, you check a checksum and then you, you flag that your chip is bad uh, if, if you see a mismatch. Um, that's in contrast to something like the, interconnect, uh, sorry, the, the internet, where you know, checksums are basically an integral part of every packet, and it's just a routine thing to say, okay, that packet got mingled, I'm going to drop it, and the system will retry. 
Um, so a very, very different sort of design point there, um, but it works for the most part for, you know, uh, for on-chip uh, applications. Um, okay, and then there are some other aspects as well that sort of drive actually some more recent research. So one example is um, the NOC shares resources with the rest of the chip, right? So concretely, die area and power, um, and to a lesser extent, timing, if you know, the critical path in the NOC becomes longer than the rest of the chip. So basically, you need to consider, okay, if you use a lot of area for buffers, for example, that could take away area from other things on the chip, like last level cache. And that can affect total system performance. So that's a trade-off you need to consider. Um, so yeah, so that, that could affect you know, limited buffering space, for example. Um, and then there are some other concrete things. So like it's, it's easier to build a hypercube if you have three dimensions and you're building this physically than if you're constrained to a 2D planar chip. Um, and so you know, that can affect sort of the topologies that we design. And we talked about things like folding tori where you can get around that to some degree. But uh, okay, so those are at a high level just some, uh, I guess, trade-offs and interesting design points. So at this point, I'm ready to move on. Um, do you guys have any questions about the basics or anything at all? Life, the universe, anything? OK, cool. So let's talk about Bless. Uh, this was work presented by uh, owner, so your teacher, my advisor, uh, in ISCA 2009. And so the basic idea here is it's, um, it's proposing a new router design for on-chip networks that's supposed to be and is, in fact, cheaper uh, than sort of conventional um, routers, uh, conventional buffered routers. And the key idea is that it's bufferless, so you get rid of the buffer. So I'll tell you how that works. So, okay, I'll skip the background. Actually, I'll skip a lot of slides here because you've already seen a lot of this. But basically, you have an on-chip network, connects cores and cache. Um, there are some examples, the Intel Terascale, MIT RAW. Um, you design for high throughput, low latency, and you want low complexity and low cost. And you also, like I just mentioned, want low power and um, fairly low energy. Right? So it turns out that energy is actually a key uh, sort of constraint. So just to give a few data points here, in the Intel 80 core tel uh, Teraskill chip, 30% uh, of the total chip power was actually spent in the interconnect. MIT RAW was 40%. Um, some more recent numbers, um, you know, some other systems now are reporting something like 10 or 20%. So it's gotten um, you know, reduced a little bit, but it's still a significant portion of chip power. So you'd like to address that somehow. Um, and okay, these are self-timed. That's annoying. Uh, and so in addition to um, the power, there's also area. So uh, there aren't numbers here, but uh, buffers consume something like 75% of the total router area uh, in, in one, re so in the uh, UT Austin TRIPS chip, for example. Um, so in terms of both area and power, NOx have gotten expensive, and we want to try and optimize that. Um, so there are existing approaches to try and optimize things. Um, there are different ways to build topologies that could be more or less expensive, um, different ways to optimize um, you know, all the different aspects. Um, but the existing work sort of assumes the existence of buffers. So that's just sort of a given that you'll have a router, you'll have these input buffers, traffic will enter the buffers and wait there until it moves on to the next top. Um, so, okay, we've already seen this picture before, but if you look at a typical router, we have these buffers at the inputs. Um, and so when, when flits arrive, they basically enter the buffers and then they traverse the crossbar eventually and leave the router. Um, so, it's an, so it's an integral part of the router design. And in fact, the buffers are necessary for high throughput. So if you, if you actually look at these load delay curves that I just talked about and you plot injection rate versus average latency, you can see, uh, you know, just with the standard workloads, if you increase um, the buffer capacity, you'll actually see uh, increased network um, capacity as well. So uh, with more buffers, your saturation point moves to the right, moves to higher injection rate. Um, however, buffers are also a big part of this energy and power problem, uh, and area as well, it turns out. So basically, they, they consume dynamic energy when you uh, read and write flits, right? because every flit that comes in needs to be written to the buffer, then eventually read back. Um, and they also consume static energy just by being there. And they also add complexity and latency. right? So you have um, this complexity in managing the space in the buffers uh, and uh, just sort of uh, accessing them. Right? And then finally, they, okay, so there's a TRIPS number. They consume significant area as well, so 75% of the uh, total router area. So the, the high-level question is, can we get rid of buffers? Right? Will this work? So if we do, how much throughput do we lose? Right? That's the first question we want to ask. How is latency affected? Um, will that affect us in our applications? 
Um, so basically, you know, we, we can imagine there will be some injection rate up to which it still will work well, even without buffers. Uh, and so the question is, can we, are there realistic scenarios where we could actually still use the system and it would still be useful? And then will this also reduce energy and area and all that good stuff? So yeah, so the answers are in the blessed paper, which you've already read. Um, but the basic idea is that uh, we can operate without buffers because we can always forward all incoming flits to some output port. So this is sort of the key thing that makes bufferless routing work. So because, for example, we have four inputs, four outputs, we can always send the flits to some outputs such that uh, you know, we, we come up with some permutation, basically. Um, in the worst case, if there's no available output port that leads to a packet's destination, all we've done is we've sent the packet in some other direction. So that's a deflection. Um, but it still remains in the network, and then hopefully it'll eventually get back to where it wants to go. Um, so this is an old idea. It's called uh, hot potato routing originally. Um, it's, it's known as deflection routing in more recent work. Um, but, you know, proposed in 1964. Uh, but it's a very simple idea, and it turns out that it works pretty well. So to build a bufferless router, first we remove the buffers. Uh, you know, that's the obvious part. Um, and we also remove the control logic and replace it with something simpler, which is just this logic that basically performs uh, deflection routing or hot potato routing. So how does this work? First what we do is, um, sorry, when flits come in, we'll create some ranking over all the incoming flits. So I'll talk about how this works in a second, but basically each flit has some priority and we sort by that priority. And then once the flits are sorted in that priority order, we assign output ports for the flits one at a time. So for the highest priority flit, give that flit the output that it requests that moves closer to its destination. And then the next flit, we give the next best output port to that flit, so on and so forth. Uh, in the best case, every flit will be allocated an output port that leads closer to its destination. But even if not every flit gets a productive output port, uh, productive meaning closer to its destination, at least the highest priority flit will. And so that's key in why this actually works. Um, okay, so the reason this actually works is what's called oldest first arbitration. What this means is that the flit ranking is based solely on a timestamp on the flit. Um, so we actually, so we break ties as well um, with some other fields, but the, the, the um, sort of highest significance field is the, the age. Um, so the reason that this gives proper operation is that if you rank all the flits in the system by age, there's always one oldest flit. Uh, again, we break ties by some other fields, but just assume there's one oldest flit. Um, that oldest flit will always be the highest ranked flit in any router at which it arrives, and so it will always be sent closer to its destination. So because of this, the oldest flit in the system is guaranteed to make forward progress, and it will eventually reach its destination. Once it does, it leaves the network, and at that point, some other flit is the oldest flit. And so you can, you can see there's sort of this inductive argument where one flit is the oldest, it'll eventually be delivered, then some other flit becomes oldest, it's delivered, so on and so forth. Eventually, every flit in the network is delivered. So this, this, uh, this actually works fairly well um, and gives us proper operation. Um, so, okay, I'll skip over some of the other details. Um, but basically, so that, that property where oldest flit guarantees, uh, that, or oldest first guarantees every flit is delivered is called uh, live lock free operation. And we'll get to that in Chipper in just a little bit. Um, so there are you know, some potential downsides here. Um, it's not energy optimal. What that means is that, um, so we actually, every flit is routed independently. So unlike in a wormhole router where only the header flit carries routed information, here we actually need some extra wires uh, in the link width to give every flit some routed information uh, because flits can be deflected and take different paths. Um, it also means we need re uh, reassembly or receive buffers to put flits back together. Um, I won't talk about that in detail, but basically um, this does have some downsides. Um, but overall, um, I'll skip to the results. It turns out it gives us reasonable performance. I'll skip over worm bless for time. Reasonable performance with really good energy reductions. Skip over all of this. Okay, so it's evaluated with multi-program spec, simulated on 16 and 64 node systems. Um, and energy is modeled as well. So here's a low delay curve. So the first thing we see is sort of what we expect. So if we take the baseline, which is just a standard virtual channel buffered router, and we look at its average latency as a function of the injection rate, so the amount of traffic we pump into the network, um, it gets essentially the highest saturation point. So that's the dotted line at the right. Now if we look at BLESS, it actually gets 
So there are a few different variants here. He gets about half the throughput uh, on average. So the question that uh, I guess Thomas Moshe Broda asked here is, is Bless doomed? Um, fortunately, the answer is no. Uh, so basically, if we look at this in a real system, remember I talked about the different levels of performance. So there's latency, there's throughput, and then at the very bottom there's application performance. If we look at what actually matters, which is application performance, it turns out that there's essentially almost no effect. Um, so here I'm showing, so there are three different design points. There's um, 4x4 four four, uh, with two different ways of arranging the nodes and then 8x8. Eight eight. And then, uh, so basically the first three bars in any given bar group are buffered and the rest are different variants of bless. It turns out the performance is actually almost the same. And if we do this uh, pipeline optimization they talk about in the paper, you can actually get better performance because you have lower per router latency. Um, so why? The question is why? Um, the reason, uh, so I think the slides get into this eventually, I'll just go fast. Uh, the reason basically that this works is that the average uh, presented load from these workloads is low enough that uh, you stay in this region of the load delay curve where you have good latency, right? So basically the observation that Bless makes is that um, most of the injection rates on average in these real application workloads are not extremely high. Uh, the reason for this, so you may remember from the paper, uh, they talk about this concept called self-throttling where um, you know, an out-of-order engine only has so much outstanding work it can do at a given time, you know, the, the window size basically. Uh, and so at a certain point, um, if you don't return responses to a core, it can't inject more responses. So the network in some sense self-throttles uh, if, you know, if, if there's some latency increase, so you don't see too much presented load. Um, so that's the reason that you can basically get reasonable performance with this router despite its uh, reduced throughput if you look at it just from a strictly network perspective. Um, and then there's also this additional advantage which is that bufferless deflection routing is sort of implicitly adaptive in the sense of deflections give you non-minimal adaptive routing, right? So if you have um, these, no, these, um, these routers and then you have links between them and two packets contend and they both want to go to the same place, one of the packets gets deflected in a sense, instead of using a buffer in that router uh, to hold the deflected packet, you're actually using the other link as a buffer, right? So the, in a sense, the entire uh, network of links is actually a collection of buffers. And so this sort of implicitly spreads your network load across the network, which gives you this uh, adaptivity basically for free. Um, so for these reasons, actually, you can see reasonable performance in a bufferless network. Um, here are some more performance results. And sort of the takeaway here is that we actually reduce network energy significantly as well. And the reason is basically that we get rid of both the static energy, just from having these buffers in the first place, um, you know, this is leakage power basically, and we also get, get rid of the dynamic energy that uh, we, would, we would have consumed by placing flits into the buffers and reading them back out. Um, so we save energy in that regard. Okay. That's basically all I want to talk about with Bless. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to talk about is Chipper. Um, this basically makes Bless um, more implementable. Um, so I'll only give a very brief overview and then I'll go into another contribution, which is MIMBD. And then I'll give Kevin maybe uh, 15 minutes at the end, if that's okay. 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 So Chipper is a follow-on follow to Bless. Um, this is work that was done in HPCA 2011. Uh, and so the idea here is that Bless is a bufferless deflection router. Chipper is a low complexity bufferless deflection router. So we, we found and we addressed some problems in, uh, in the prior work. So prior work has proposed bufferless deflection routing, which I just talked about. Uh, gives these nice advantages, energy savings, area reduction, minimal performance loss. Unfortunately, there are several unaddressed complexities in the router. Um, so the one that I'll focus on in this talk is that there's um, a long critical path, and that's because of the way that the arbiter works. Um, there also, there's also this problem of reassembly buffers, which I won't get into today. But basically the goal is that we want to obtain the benefits of bufferless deflection routing, so the lower hardware cost with reasonable performance while addressing these complexities to make the scheme uh, practical. So what do bufferless deflection routers do? Uh, the first thing uh, that they must do, the first thing that they must do is that they must provide live lock freedom. So I mentioned this briefly before, but live lock freedom basically means uh, that every flit or every packet that enters the network will eventually reach its destination. It won't be deflected in circle forever. Um, the second thing that they have to do is they reassemble packets on arrival. Um, so it turns out that packets are made of flits, um, 
you know, we've already sort of talked about that. I won't talk more about that problem in this version of the talk. Um, I'll just talk about the first one. So let's take a high level view of what a bufferless router actually looks like. So we have a router connected to some local node and you know, there are some number, let's say four links that connect to its neighbors in a 2D mesh. So if we zoom in, uh, it actually looks something like this. So we have the four links that come in for our neighbors and then some link that comes in for our, our local node and then there's some black box that I'm just calling deflection routing logic that basically takes, takes these flits, does this uh, priority sort and uh, you know, port assignment somehow to permute these inputs to the outputs. And then once it makes those decisions, there's some crossbar that actually sends the flits on their way and then they move on to the next link, uh, the, the next hop. Um, so let's talk about uh, how, this, uh, how this logic actually works and let's see if we can make it simpler. So I'll skip that. So as I just mentioned, BLESS solves the live lock freedom problem by sorting flits by age, then assigning the flits in age order to the output ports. This works, unfortunately, it leads to a long critical path, right? And it turns out it's 43% longer than the baseline buffered router. And I'll skip the second problem. So again, the reason this works is that we have a total order among the flits. There's some oldest flit that's guaranteed to make progress. And once that flit arrives, then some other flit becomes oldest. But what's the cost of doing this? So first, routers need to sort the flits by age. So let's say this is inside a single router. We have four inputs from our neighbors, and a set of four flits arrives on a given cycle. So basically, in order to sort the flits by age, we need three comparator stages. Uh, so this is basically a bitonic sort network. And three is sort of the, the theoretical minimum to make this work. Um, and so the, you know, this in itself leads to a long critical path. But even once we have the flits sorted, we have uh, the second part of the problem, which is we need to assign the flits to output ports. And it turns out this leads to a long um, sequential dependence as well. And so the reason for this is that, you know, say we have the highest priority flit once they're sorted. It can get any port that it wants, right? So there's some uh, sort of abstract arbiter block or arbiter piece here that assigns this flit to an output. And then it needs to communicate to the next piece of the arbiter which ports are still free. So in this case, the first flit requested and got the east output. And then this arbiter block tells the next piece of the arbiter, OK, north, south, and west are still free. Right, and east is taken. So when the next flit requests east as well, for example, then this arbiter block actually needs to deflect the flit and send it to some other port. In this example, maybe north. Right, so then we have the available ports, and we assign the other flits to their ports, so on and so forth. Um, so basically, this, long, uh, th this communication, this sequential dependence, leads to this long critical path. So altogether, we have both the priority sort and we have the port allocator. And together, these lead to a 43% longer critical path, as I mentioned. So the question that we asked in this work, is there a cheaper way uh, to route while guaranteeing live lock freedom? So we asked, what is really necessary to provide live lock free routing? Um, so previously, we had this total order, right? Um, what we realized is that we don't need the total order. Rather, it's enough to first pick one flit and prioritize that one flit in the network until it arrives. So, this, so previously, this is the oldest flit. Now we call it the golden flit. Um, you can thank Chris Craig for that name. Uh, second, we ensure that any flit, if it stays in the network long enough, is eventually picked. So what this means is that you know, we pick some flit, it becomes golden, it's delivered to its destination. Now, if the other flits are sort of swarming around, getting deflected, maybe sometimes making progress, maybe sometimes not, but if some flit is stuck long enough, we need to guarantee in some deterministic way that that stuck flit will be picked and will become golden and will be delivered to its destination. And that will be sufficient to guarantee live lock free uh, routing for any flit in the network. Okay. So that's the basic idea. Um, you can see the paper for more details of you know, how we pick the golden flit, how we make those guarantees. Um, but basically, that's the high level insight. So what do we need to do in order to build a router based around this golden flit priority scheme? So we only need to properly route the golden flit. We don't need to do anything for the other three flits. You know, it would be nice to, uh, uh, for more performance, to give proper routing to all the flits. But only one flit needs to be properly routed if it's the golden flit. So the first insight is we don't need the full sort. And the second is that we don't need the sequential allocation. Rather, let's, let's sort of build a router from the ground up. So let's start from uh, just a simple two input, two output case. And let, so let's say that this router gets uh, you know, two flits on the input and one of them may be golden. So in this case, uh, we just adopt a very simple two-step process where first we look at the flits that come in and we pick one of the flits as what we call a winning flit. So if the golden flit is present, it's the winning flit. Otherwise, just pseudo-randomly pick 
one of the inputs. And of course, it's only one flit is present, that flit is the winning flit. Uh, the second step is that we take the winning flit and steer it toward its desired output. So its desired output is whichever output leads to its, uh, its destination, basically. Uh, moves it closer to its destination. And then once that flit picks its output, if there's some other flit present, its output is automatically determined because there's only one choice left. Right? So that's very simple, um, but it still gives correct operation because if a golden flit is present, it's always sent toward its destination. So now what we do is we actually build a four input, four output router. So in, you know, this is for a 2D mesh. You could extend this for other topologies as well uh, by basically connecting multiple copies of this basic two input block. And so in this case, what we've done is we've basically connected them in this two stage. Um, you can think of this as almost like an indirect network where the router inputs lead to the router outputs and flits basically progress through this, uh, through this arbitration network uh, and make their way toward some output. And so what happens here is that deflection is actually a distributed decision, meaning that there's no sort of sequential dependence anymore where you know, uh, one flit's allocated, then the next, then the next, then the next to an output port and some are deflected. Rather, flits just sort of naturally contend within this uh, arbitration fabric and some of them get deflected as a uh, distributed decision. Um, so I'll skip this example for time. Um, but basically that's how it works. So let's look at some results. Um, so methodology basically the same as before. Um, performance. So I'm showing here uh, bless, uh, so with two baselines, we have uh, a buffered virtual channel router is one baseline. That's sort of the, you know, in a sense, the standard baseline um, with the high performance that we want to try and match. And then I'm also showing in the red bar uh, set the uh, bless router. So this is what we just talked about. This is sort of the baseline bufferless deflection router. And then in the green is chipper. So the first conclusion is that on average, chipper reduces performance by 13.6% from the baseline buffered. Obviously, that's not ideal. You know, we don't want to reduce performance, but the, you know, it's not that much. And the trade-off, of course, is the much simpler, cheaper router. But if we deconstruct that, OK, and then in multi-threaded, we run as well, we get 1.8% um, performance loss. But if we deconstruct that 13.6% 13 a little bit more, what we see is that if we take the bottom two-thirds of the workloads by um, average network intensity, or the amount of network traffic they generate, um, and average those is only 3.6% performance loss on average. On the other hand, if we look at only the top three workloads, so this is a matrix multiply, a memory bandwidth test, and MCF, which is a well-known memory intensive benchmark, um, those all together uh, see about half performance loss, so about 50% performance loss on average. And so the average is really being skewed by these top um, workloads. So this is sort of the same insight that Bless had, which is that most workloads have fairly reasonable network intensity, and we can actually get most of the performance um, you know, that the, the baseline has just by having this low-cost network that serves those workloads. Uh, there are a few workloads at the high end, however, that are really network intense, and for those, we do lose more, for more performance. That's the trade-off we make. Um, but the benefit of that trade-off is much reduced power, so I'm showing buffered bless chipper. Um, so basically, we get about the same uh, power reduction as chipper, a little bit more, actually, uh, a few percent more. And then finally, if we look at router area critical paths, so we keep the router area savings that Bless had, again, just mostly by removing the buffers, um, but we also reduce the critical path. And so this is sort of the, uh, the main point of chipper is to make the router practically implementable uh, by, by having this more scalable arbitration scheme. Okay, so in conclusion, basically, uh, Bless had this long critical path, and chipper proposed this scalable uh, arbitration scheme that solved that critical path. Problem, of course, was the uh, high load case, right? So this is another work. This is from Knox 2012, uh, about a year and three months later. Uh, this is called the Minimally Buffered Deflection Routing uh, Router for Energy Efficient Interconnect. So this solves the high load problem. OK, so I already talked about the key idea with bufferless deflection routing. Um, it gives significantly reduced power and die area. The problem is that at high network utilization, so those three cases I just highlighted with 50% you know, performance loss, um, bufferless deflection routing causes unnecessary link and router traversals. So this reduces network throughput um, and, and therefore application performance. You know, because we're having unnecessary link traversals, it also increases dynamic power. So the goal here is that uh, we want to improve the high load performance of these bufferless networks, uh, these low cost uh, bufferless deflection networks, by reducing the deflection rate. Um, 
So let me give some, okay, so I'm gonna skip the background. So basically there are three main uh, concerns that we need to, uh, to address in bufferless deflection routing. The first two are correctness issues. So we need to deliver packets without live lock and reassemble packets without deadlock. Chipper solved both of those problems. Uh, the one remaining problem is the performance problem, which is that at high load, performance degrades. And so we're going to solve that problem here. So what are the key performance issues? The first is link contention. Basically, because we, we designed the system with no buffers to hold traffic, any link contention, so that means any time two packets arrive at a router in the same cycle and want to use the same link, only um, one of them can use a link, and so the other uh, packet needs to be deflected. Right? And so this, this causes performance loss. Uh, the second problem that we actually observed when we looked more closely at the network was what we call the ejection bottleneck. And so this is fairly simple. Basically, it's only one FLIT is allowed to eject per router per cycle. Uh, eject meaning leave the network when it reaches its destination. Uh, and this turns out to cause a, a bottleneck in the system. Um, and so we'll, we'll look at that as well. And then finally, there's this problem in deflection arbitration, which is um, because of the way that the practical or fast deflection arbiter was built, um, there is some performance loss there. Um, so, just for time, I'm only going to talk about the first, but the key idea here is that we use what we call side buffers uh, to sort of uh, remove some of the deflections. So I'll talk about that now. So the problem is that any link, link contention causes a deflection. We, we observe that buffering a flight can avoid the deflection, right? So this is sort of going back in the direction we came uh, from the original buffered router design, um, but as you'll see, it's not quite going back all the way. Um, right, because these input buffers are expensive. Uh, because if we buffer all the flits on every hop, so anytime any traffic arrives, if we buffer all the traffic all the time, this leads to high dynamic energy because we have basically a buffer write and a buffer read uh, per hop per flit. It also means that we need large buffers because, you know, again, we're, we're using the buffers at every hop, um, and so we need to provision them for that. And so this leads to high static energy and large area. So the first key idea that we have and the only one I'll talk about today, is that we add a small buffer to the bufferless deflection router to buffer only the flits that would have been deflected. So this is in contrast to buffering everything. Rather, we only buffer um, some flits. So let's see how this works. So in the baseline router, this is the chipper uh, permutation network I just showed you. Um, I'm showing as well as some more details. So we have the ejection, injection. Um, you can ignore that for now. Um, so basically, when we have two flits and they want to go uh, to some destinations that would conflict in the permutation network, one of them gets deflected. So the key idea is that we add this side buffer, and we add some logic at the router outputs that recognizes deflected flits. So now if we have this case where one flit gets deflected, this extra logic at the router output actually sees that one flit is deflected. If more than one flit is deflected, it'll pick one of them. And it actually takes this flit and removes it from the router pipeline and buffers it in this small side buffer, which is just a FIFO. Uh, in our design, it's, like, it's, it's four flits deep. So it's a very small buffer. But the, the uh, flit now waits in the side buffer out of the network. And then finally, at some later point, when there's an available slot uh, in the network, we re-inject this flit back into the network, and it tries arbitration again. And so at this point, then, it's possible, but, uh, possible that there's not any contention. If the contention was just, uh, for example, bursty, or just a random occurrence, and now this flit doesn't need to be deflected, rather it can be sent straight to its destination. And so by buffering this flit, we've actually avoided the deflection. So why does this work well? Right? So basically what we're doing is we're buffering some flits and deflecting other flits at a per flit level. So rather than the conventional buffered router, for example, which buffers everything right, all the time, or the conventional bufferless router, which never buffers anything and only deflects, uh, this is actually making a per flit decision whether to buffer or to deflect. Right, so relative to a bufferless router, the deflection rate reduces because some of the flits that would have been deflected we pull out of the network and save in a buffer. And so it turns out that this four flit buffer actually reduces deflection rate by 39%. On the other hand, relative to buffered routers, so conventional input buffered routers, the buffer is more efficiently used. Because we're not buffering everything that comes in, we're only using the buffer sort of on demand or when it's dynamically necessary, if you will. Um, Right, so what this means is that we actually get similar performance to the baseline buffered router, uh, input buffered router, with only 25% of the buffer space in our side buffer. So that's the first and the main contribution to MinBD. Um, I'll skip the other two. And I'll go straight to results for a few minutes, and then I'll turn it over to Kevin. Okay. 
So we add silver flits to augment the gold flits. Uh, OK, methodology about the same. Uh, I'm going to show you a few different baselines. So I'll show you three different variants of the baseline input buffer router. It's just different buffer sizes. So sort of a extreme large buffers, extreme small buffers, and then something reasonable in the middle, um, as well as chipper. And I'll also compare it to another hybrid buffer, bufferless design called uh, adaptive flow control, AFC. Uh, and you can see more about all this in the paper, by the way, if you're interested. Um, so the first takeaway, uh, if I'm showing you uh, deflection rate here, is that all the mechanisms individually reduce deflection. So let me explain this graph a little bit. So I'm basically showing uh, two different things here. I'm showing deflection rate, and I'm showing uh, on the bottom here with the numbers, and I'm also showing performance as weighted speed up um, on the y-axis with these bars. And so I'm showing you a few different bars here. I'm showing you baseline, which is just chipper, and then uh, B, D, and S are the side buffer dual ejection silver flits by themselves. So these are the three different contributions we have. And then the last two bars are combinations. So the last, the pink bar, um, B plus S plus D is all three together is min BD. So the first takeaway we have is that all mechanisms individually reduce deflections, if you look at deflection rate. Um, but the side buffer alone is not sufficient to get performance. And so the reason for this is that the ejection bottleneck, which I didn't talk about, actually holds back the system. So if we um, use the side buffers to improve the in-network throughput, we actually create more queuing delay at ejection and we actually degrade performance. So we need to combine basically those two contributions in order to get performance. And then when we add silver flits on top, we get even uh, just a little bit more. So overall, we get 5.8% uh, per performance over baseline uh, chipper and 2.7% over the dual ejection, which is a fair comparison detail I won't talk about. Um, basically, we come about halfway to closing the gap between bufferless and buffered. Uh, we reduce power significantly even compared to chipper because we reduce dynamic power by reducing deflections. And we're the most energy efficient. Um, so that's MIMBD. This is power on the X, performance on the Y. Um, so to the left and up would be more performance per power. Uh, and so if you draw the line through MIMBD and then all the way down to the origin, MIMBD is the most energy efficient design. And then some more details. So we increase the critical path slightly. That's the trade-off we make. And in conclusion, so MIMBD basically took the high load problem, right? So bufferless deflection is nice because it reduces power and area, but it hurts at high load. So MIMBD takes this problem and contributes three main mechanisms, side buffers and a few other things I didn't talk about. In exchange, we still get reduced power and area, uh, but we also get improved performance relative to the buffers, bufferless routers. And so we get something that's the best energy efficiency of all the designs uh, with competitive performance. So that's all I had to talk about for today. Um, Made it through 135 slides. Now it's Kevin's turn. Hi everyone, my name is Kevin. Today I'll be presenting HAT, Heterogeneous Adapter Throttling for On-Chip Networks. So this is a joint work with Rachada, Chris, and Dr. Owner Mu. Here's a one slide executor summary of the talk today. The main problem is that packets contained in on-chip networks causing congestion. As a result, it reduces performance. We make two key observations in this work. First, some applications are more sensitive to network latency than others. Second, applications must be throttled differently to achieve peak performance. Based on these two key observations, we develop our work, a new source throttling mechanism called Heterogeneous Adapter Throttling, HAT, which has two key components. The first key component is application-aware source throttling, which selectively throttles certain applications. Second, network load-aware throttling rate adjustment, which dynamically throttles which dynamically adjusts the throttling rate to achieve high performance. Our evaluation shows that HAT improves performance and energy efficiency over state-of-the-art source throttling works. So here's just the outline, and I think I can just skip the background. Okay, 
So in modern multi-core processor, NOC has limited shared resources due to design constraints such as power, chip area, and timing. As a result, NOCs will sometimes experience network congestions when there's a large amount of traffic. Network congestion reduces network throughput and hence application performance. So let's take a look at how network congestion can occur in the network. So here four different nodes are sending their packets to a central node in the, in the, uh, in the network. Uh, since there is no free output link, the yellow packet cannot be injected into the network, thus causing congestion. So the goal of this work is to improve performance in a highly congested NOC. We observe that reducing network load decreases network congestion, hence improves performance. The approach we take to reduce network load is by source throttling, which temporarily delays new traffic injection into the network. Although packets are delayed, but the performance can still be improved because of less congestion. A naive mechanism of source throttling is to throttle every single node, which completely blocks the injections of every node. However, we find this does not work very well. We'll go through some key observations on how to further improve performance benefits of source throttling. Our first key observation is that different applications respond differently to changes in network latency. To illustrate this point, we set up an experiment on a 16-node system with eight copies of Gromax, which is a network non-intensive benchmark, and eight copies of MCF, which is a network-intensive benchmark. The figure shows the performance of the workload when different applications are throttled. The y-axis is the normalized performance compared to the baseline without any throttling. The x-axis are different throughput measurements. As we can see in the figure, when only Gromax is throttled, the average system performance actually decreases by 2%. On the other hand, when MCF is throttled, the average system performance actually increases by 90%. This is because throttling MCF reduces congestion significantly, significantly which allows Gromax, a network non-intensive application, to traverse through the network more quickly. In the sum, we would like to throttle network intensive applications since it benefits system performance more than throttling network non-intensive applications. Our second key observation is that different workloads achieve peak performance at different throttling rates. To illustrate this point, we show the system performance of three heterogeneous application workloads. The y-axis here shows the performance in terms of weighted speed up, and the x-axis shows different throttling rates. And as the figure shows, different, application, different workloads achieve perf peak performance at different throttling rates. For example, workload one achieves peak performance at 94%, whereas workload three achieves peak performance at 90%. As a result, dynamically adjusting throttling rate yields better performance than using a single static throttling rate. Next, we'll talk about our mechanism built on top of these two key observations. The, so here, based on these two key observations, we develop heterogeneous adaptive throttling, HAT, which has two key components. The first component is application-aware throttling, which throttles network-intensive applications that interfere with network non-intensive applications. The second component, network load-aware throttling rate adjustment, HAT dynamically adjusts throttling rate to adapt to different workloads in order to achieve high performance. Now we'll talk about how HAT performs application-aware throttling. First, it needs to measure network intensity of different applications. In the system we evaluated, NOC primarily serves L1 cache misses. As a result, we use L1 and PKI to estimate the network intensity of each application. After application's intensity is measured, we need to classify each application as either network intensive or non-intensive. First, HAT sorts applications by their L1 and PKI, and starting from the application with the least L1 and PKI, applications are classified as network non-intensive, 
if their sum of MPKI is less than a preset threshold, which we call a non-intensive cap, the non using non-intensive cap ensures the traffic injected by network non-intensive non applications produce sufficient network load without causing network con severe uh, network congestion. All the remaining applications are simply classified as network intensive. Alas, uh, HAT just simply throttles network intensive applications. Again, the reason that we throttle network intensive applications is to reduce network congestion to allow network non-intensive applications to get through a network more quickly. Now we'll talk about how HAT implements the second key component. We observe that for a given network design, peak performance tends to occur at a fixed network load point. Therefore, dynamically, we would like to dynamically adjust throttle and rate to achieve that network load point. To do so, HAT performs the following, performs the following operations. First, it measures network load, which is described in detail in the paper. Next, it compares the current network load with the peak point and adjusts the throttling rate accordingly. If a network load is bigger than the peak point, peak point it simply increases the throttling rate to reduce network load. Otherwise, it just decreases its throttling rate to allow more packets to be injected into the network. So continuous hat operation is expensive if you perform it cycle by cycle. So the solution is to perform hat at epoch granularity. In this work, we define epoch length as 100K cycles. During an epoch, hat measures, measures L1 and PKI of each application and the network load. And once an epoch is finished, hat class uses these measurements to classify applications and adjust throttling rate for the applications. At the end, it also resets the measurements for the new epoch. And to this end, we have presented HAT. And let's take a look at prior works. In the evaluation section, we compare to two prior source throttling works. The first work by Nitrous et al. proposes application wear throttling based on starvation rate. However, it does not adaptively, adaptively adjust throttling rate. We simply call this work heterogeneous throttling in our evaluation section. The second work by Thodi Thodi et al. proposes dynamically trigger, which proposes dynamically triggering throttling based on the fraction of buffer occupancy. In this work, not only is it not application where, but it also fully blocks the injections of every single node. And we simply call this work self-tuned throttling in our evaluation section. So the methodology is the same as Chipper and MIMBD. And we form 60 multi-core workloads using spec. And the applications are categorized uh, based on their intensity. We have three categories, low, medium, and high. And here's the performance results on bufferless network. The y-axis here shows the weighted speed up, and the x-axis shows different workload categories. Each workload category contains 15 workloads. And for each bar group, the blue bar, the first blue bar is the baseline without any th throttling. The second red bar is heterogeneous throttling by Nitrous et al. And the third bar is HAT. We make the following observations. First, HAT consistently provides higher performance improvement than past works. On average, improves performance by 7.4% over heterogeneous throttling. Second, it provides highest improvement on heterogeneous workload mixes because low and medium ap intensity applications are more sensitive to network latency. As a result, performing HAT gives higher benefits. And this is a performance results on buffered, on buffered NOC. And the performance trends look similar as in bufferless NOC. Although congestion is much lower in buffer knock, HAT can still provide performance benefit. Okay. And in this slide, we're showing that HAT does not unfairly penalize any applications by performing throttling. The y-axis shows the normalized maximum slowdown compared to the baseline without any throttling. And the left bar group 
shows the results on Buffler's network. The right wire group shows results on buffered network. So the high level observation is that HAT provides better fairness than prior works by, do, by reducing congestion in the network. In addition, we also shows energy efficiency as performance per watt of using HAT. And on average, HAT increases energy efficiency by 8.5% and 5% over blessed and buffered respectively. And this is due to reduced congestion such that packets can get through the, the network more efficiently. And there are other results in the paper. If you guys are interested, please take a look at it. And in conclusion, we address the problem of network congestion caused by packets contending in the network. And we have two key observations. And based on these two key observations, we propose heterogeneous adaptive throttling. And our result shows that it performs better than, it performs better than prior works. All right, thanks.